Well, good afternoon, everybody. Al Gettler here. I'm so glad you could join me today talking to you from Vermont, where, you know, I had a look at the end of that video with the snow on the mountain, and we are just weeks away from that here in the Green Mountains. But a really, really good show for you today. Uh, it's one of those things where I am covering a subject that is a giant pet peeve of mine, something that um, certainly since the pandemic, uh, it, it's been a, a, a bigger pet peeve. But before that, uh, when I discovered Zoom and started doing more with Zoom and, and broadcasting, and well, actually, it goes all the way back to uh, ancient days of 2015 when I did my first video effort. And we'll talk about that because this person's uh, partner in business there, uh, uh, whose company uh, she works for, it's named after, she was on the first iteration of my show. So today we're going to have on the show Patty Sanchez, and she has written a brand new book that is available, Presenting Virtually, Communicate and Connect with Online Audiences. Such a very important uh, topic to me. We could, just can't talk about it enough, giving everything we're doing online, and I don't think it's going to end. But before I make predictions, let me bring on my guest, ladies and gentlemen, Patty Sanchez. Hi, Patty. Hey, Al. Thanks for having me. I was really well, enjoying your uh, intro music, by the way, too. It was throwing you back to the 80s. <laughs> a little, little head the slap in there, heart. huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got in touch with my rock and roll roots, right? Right. Well, there you go. I'm yeah, right you know, you. Uh, Patty, it's, uh, it's so great to talk to you about this subject. Like I started talking about, it's just, you know, gosh, there's so many better things we could be doing. Uh, well, let, let's go back a step, right? I mean, you know, let, let me throw something up on the screen. And this is a, a shot of Nancy here, um, you know, which is kind of like the OG of God, let's please start presenting better. Back to uh, Slideology uh, and then Resonate. And then the two of you wrote this fantastic book, Illuminate, which, you know, you've been you've been screaming from the mountaintops. Let's do a better job of presenting, right? I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And communicating. Just yeah. in general, there's there are a lot of great ideas that need to be heard, but they're not going to get the audience they deserve if you don't communicate them well. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to my days in conference rooms with um, when projectors were new and the finance people would get up there with spreadsheets and put them on. <laughs> on slides. Oh boy, I remember that. And it goes yeah. all the way back to transparencies. You yeah, know, you well, I do one too. by one and they're yeah. almost illegible. Actually, you know, I go back to two, and, and Nancy and I talked about this, um, uh, and I should mention Nancy Duarte. I didn't even say that when the slide was up there, but Nancy Duarte, uh, whom the company is, is uh, named after her and her husband, Nancy told me she used to do 35 millimeter slides of, of slides, if you will, which is where the term comes from. I was the marketing guy that used to put those presentations together. So I remember those days, but yeah. But even then we had a license to bore. So very quickly before we jump in the book, Let's talk about Duarte. Could you give me a, a, just a few seconds on what you guys do and, and, and why, why you exist and, and what it is you offer people? Absolutely. Well, we exist to help people communicate better, to help them communicate their ideas clearly with impact and ultimately to increase their influence so that those ideas can spread. And so we have a consulting business and we have a training business. And I'm the head of product for the training business, building essentially workshops and online courses that will help people develop those improved communication skills and present better. Yeah, great resources all the way around. And as I just had on the overlay slide there, I mean, you know, you have so much that you offer people. And are we gonna get it back around to regional training again live? Is that coming some, maybe 2000, you know, 22, we're gonna see that again? Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, yeah. I talked to a lot of people in the training business and we're all just sort of holding our breath and waiting to see when we can go back to in person. It's happening in pockets, but uh, probably not until mid to late 2022 is what I see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into the book. Let's jump into this subject. It is the first Duarte guide. So talk about that for a second and then let's jump into uh, what the book is about and how we're going to apply it to everyday life. Absolutely. So it is the first in a series of guidebooks. These guidebooks, the intention of them is to be very practical handbooks, almost like a field guide you would take with you if you're going out into nature or maybe a travel guide. You're taking a trip somewhere, you know, Lord willing. And the idea of these guidebooks is essentially to be right there at your right hand as you're working on whatever piece of communication you're working on. And so first one is presenting virtually. We envision many more, uh, all in the realm of communication, but various skills that Duarte teaches from strategy to story to design and visuals, as well as to delivery and interpersonal communication. 
Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Good. Well, so as we talk about this guide approach and we talk about this book, I got to put the first comment up here about the subject, which, you know, I have to uh, agree 100 percent. The majority of presentations are awful still. So I didn't say it. OK, Alan Langer said it, but, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is that true or are we being too hard on people? Is awful a big I, word? I think awful is a strong word. Not great, maybe is what I would say. But we we just did a survey ourselves of virtual presentations. And we found that the average score over 500 people gave to those virtual presentations is 5.62 on a scale of 1 to 10, which is wow. basically an F. Yeah. So, yeah, they could yeah. be better. So, well, you know, without jumping too far ahead of what we're, you know, we'll have some things on the screen here. But what gets people that? you know, six and below score? What are the things that they fail out the most? And then we'll start maybe knocking the pins down here with some of the things we're going to talk about. Sure. Well, I think the most common problem is that people try to say too much. They try to put too much information on their slides. They they bore the audience with just point after point after point, And they don't really think about what their audience most wants to know. Uh, needs to know in that moment. And so that's the first tip is to be more discerning about what you put into your presentation, what you actually stand up and tell people versus perhaps putting into a leave behind or a read ahead. That is additional detail. You don't need to vomit on people. Right. Just be more intentional and deliberate about what you use your words for when you're in person or virtually communicating to somebody. Well, now you just, you know, Alan used the word awful and you just used the word vomit. So come on. <laughs> I, if we're being honest, it can feel like you're being vomited. Yeah. On right? and well, and Alan really came out, he said, I, I don't miss where, you know, awful, but uh, yeah, LOL. But absolutely. No, you're right. And I agree with that. I mean, I think that that's, you know, when you go back to, to slideology and resonate uh, and then illuminate, that's what it's all about, right? It's, it's the fact that we often try to put you know, five pounds of, you know, what in a one pound bag when it comes to a presentation. And um, it's uh, oftentimes leaves the audience, uh, you know, uh, wanting just clarity. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big piece of it. But now we have to add on this other piece of it, which is the fact that we're virtual, right? There yeah. are so many things that can go wrong virtually. So let's jump into uh, what I'll call, you know, our, our first overlay here and talk a bit about your model, which I think this is actually the first figure in the book. Let me put it up on the screen. So tell us about a virtual presentation and what are the pieces that go into it? And then what you also base this on too. Yeah, this is actually based on the work of Marshall McLuhan communication theorist. He's the one who, who said the medium is the message. And he did a work on uh, media and how they evolve and the qualities that they bring when they emerge. This is called the laws of media. And this graphic here in the book is an interpretation of the uh, virtual presentations and the effects that they bring with them. So this is what he called his tetrad of, of new media. And he describes that when any new medium comes to being, it has four effects all at once. It enhances the qualities of a particular communication medium, but it also obsolesces others. So it makes some things unnecessary. It also retrieves uh, qualities of earlier media and if it's overused, the new media can even reverse its own positive effects. So for instance, when you think about virtual presenting, it enhances a lot of things like our ability to reach a lot of people. So we can mm -hmm. access more people instantly without having to travel, which means it can obsolesce the need to travel, to physically be with somebody. You can, you can get a similar quality of communication if you really work at it to being in person. But the other thing that it retrieves is qualities of television, qualities of even of radio. If we study those other media, we can learn how they keep an audience who's distracted engaged. But we also have to be careful that we don't make these virtual presentations too TV-like because yeah. TV is also a very passive medium and people just click and click and click and consume yeah. without actively engaging. So you really need to balance that ease of consumption with right. keeping your audience engaged. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Right. And as you mentioned too, I mean, every medium begets another, you know, when we thought that, um, that uh, television was going to destroy radio, right? It didn't end up destroying radio. In fact, today radio still is going strong. And now I think it's called um, podcasting. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 They, they can complement each other. But yep. I, I found these insights about television in particular and the parallels to it really interesting and inspiring. When I was working with my team in the training business at Duarte last year, uh, we had, you know, in January, February of that year, we were delivering lots of in-person face-to-face training workshops. And of course, with the shutdowns because of the pandemic, we had to flip. We had to flip those to virtual. And I said to the team, well, let's make a virtual training experience that's as good at, if not better than an in-person training. And let's think about this medium. Let's think about this frame that people are experiencing us through and how we can use it to our advantage. Think back to the days of the uh, early television innovators and the things that they did to engage the audience through the camera lens. And those are a lot of things that we practice now and that I preach to help people make their virtual presentations more engaging, to create content that's consumable and interesting and fun and use a lot of variety in your delivery so that you can really keep that audience engrossed. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is so important, especially because most people have something plastic and glass on the end of their arm that when they're sitting in a virtual or a real uh, you know, situation, you can have a phone that you can flip at and look and, oh, I got a little buzz in my pocket. Uh, and maybe I even didn't, I think, you know, feel like I might have, you can pick up that phone and look at it. So, yeah, but that's a really, you know, it's really interesting when you look at that model and you look at where media always goes, we are always looking at something that's new, but something that still has a bit of the past in it. So really, really interesting. So when it comes to presenting, you also kind of lay out a bit of a table here to help us decide what to present to who and, and what it should should have. So let's let's talk about this a little bit. When we are presenting, you have these columns that say move from, move to, buy. Please explain what that is and, and how, how that kind of works. Absolutely. It's the core to the methodology that Duarte teaches in any of our training or that we practice ourselves when building communication, which is audience empathy. We don't want you to start your presentation without first thinking about your audience and not only who are they and why are they here, but what do you need to tell them? What do they need to hear from you in order to be moved in some way by the end of your presentation? We call that the audience journey because the reason you're giving a presentation in the first place is to cause some sort of shift in your audience to get them to say yes to an idea or to behave somehow differently. And so I, I teach you in the book how to plan that audience journey for your virtual presentation. You want to think about what are they thinking about your idea today? What are they feeling about your idea today? And what are they doing about this topic that you're talking about today? And then where do you want to move them to by the end of your virtual presentation? What do you want them to be thinking, feeling, and doing at the end? And then buy is essentially the strategy that you're going to use. What are you going to say or show or do during your presentation to cause that shift to happen. So where you're going to move them to, that is really amazing. You know, when you think about that and it's like a sales process, right? Where do you want to move them to? You want to move them to buy. And where do you want to move them to in your presentation? You want to move them to accept this new idea and, and, and bring it forward. So I love that, that you've got to decide where to move them to. So we had, you know, right out of the gate, one of the difficult questions uh, from Magdalena, she says the attention span of virtual presentations is much shorter than that of live shows. How do we maintain people's attention and engagement now? So I'm going to let you uh, grab that one right out of the gate. We'll throw you, we'll, we'll hit you with a difficult question uh, right out of the gate, and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on some of the answers from Magdalena. But what, what would you say in response to that question? Absolutely. Well, I have a lot to say about it in the book as well, about all the different strategies you can use to keep your audience engaged. But it's true that we have shorter attention spans. We, we pay attention for at most 10 minutes before our attention starts to wander. And for some of us, that's even earlier. And one of the first ways that you can keep your audience engaged is to hook their attention early and then hook it again and again and again throughout your presentation. And you can do that by injecting change. What I talk about in the book is the idea of novelty and how our brains respond to novelty. We're actually wired to notice things that are different in our environment. It's related to fight or flight and, and other 
processes, biological, chemical processes that make us uh, be hyper alert and attentive to things that are shifting in our environment. So if you change something in your presentation, it's going to re-engage your audience. It's going to capture their attention again and bring them back away from their inbox, away from their little phones and start to be listening to you again. So even uh, a presentation could include a short little video clip, um, a magic trick, uh, going over to the white. I mean, back in the day, I used to go over to the, I, I had a, I always ask for a white, um, you know, a flip pad on each, each side of the screen so I could walk over and change and, and, and do that. So yeah, I love that idea. Keep the variety going, keep it happening. Uh, Haley says, uh, em- yes, yeah, sympathy to your, to your comment before empathy is key. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> obviously, uh, there you go. Send out to Haley there. I'm but, a fan. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's really, really important that um, we do empathize in a number of ways with the audience. And I think the biggest way is the fact that they're sitting in the seats and you're not. So I think that um, you owe it to your audience to keep that presentation moving for that very, very specific reason. So hopefully, uh, Magdalena, we, we touched on that a bit. Uh, and it is about the variety of what we do when we present. And, you know, you guys have been saying that all along. Now, when it comes to virtual you got to have variety. You got to grab them. I love this graph that you're about to, we're about to show on the screen because everybody thinks, oh, my audience is just going to sit there and they're going to listen to me. They're going to fold their hands in their lap. There's going to be nothing going on around them. And then you open up to your figure in the book here and you show them this. <laughs> so tell us about this graph and what it's all about. Well, what it's essentially showing is all the sources of distraction that are around your audience. And I created this to help people who, like you said, are thinking it's all about them. We have a tendency to do that as humans anyway. But in reality, anybody in your audience is going to be likely pulled on by other sources in their environment that want their attention too. Whether they're at work, they maybe have got uh, Teams or some other chat window open where somebody's pinging them, uh, asking a question, or maybe they got a text from their boss or their spouse or something like that that says, there's something urgent I really need to deal with. Or if they're at home watching your presentation, then you know there might be a kid pulling at their leg or a dog trying to uh, you know grab their pants like mine sometimes does just because he wants to play. So there are all these competing sources of, of, of attention in people's environment, and you need to recognize that. Now, you can cope with that, again, by making your presentation just that much more interesting than all those other things that are trying to grab their eyeballs and ears away from you. But it's also an act of empathy to recognize that they're overwhelmed, especially right now in this environment that we're in. uh, People are working from home and they're juggling multiple things. And so recognizing that I think makes you feel a little bit more uh, sensitive to your audience's needs and more willing to work harder so that it's an interesting experience for them. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting too, when you are, when you're speaking at a conference and you're used to being on stage, you know, it's a kind of controlled environment and you've got your bottle of water in your hand and you're waiting for your introduction and then you hit the stage and that's all very nice and pleasant at home. (laughs) I mean, I've literally had the dog do something on the floor moments before I have to go on in front of a camera or the doorbell rings and every dog in the house, there's three of them barking. I mean, you know, so yeah, that is, that's so important too, as the presenter, uh, not only do you have distractions for your your viewers, but you also have to put your game face on regardless and your pants usually because in case there's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> but all oh, these boy. things can be going on around. So, I mean, there are so many factors that really come into this virtual presentation thing, which is why this book is so timely. And, and, you know, and I think the other thing we haven't acknowledged yet too, some may look at this and go, well, come on, you you know, the pandemic's been going on for a while. This is almost over. I No, it's not. I mean, I think online presenting uh, is going to be going on for a while. W- what's your thought on that? Do you think um, uh, that we'll certainly see the hybrid model for a lot of conferences and we'll certainly see online presenting even becoming more prevalent in a lot of ways? 
For sure, hybrid is likely our reality. Some organizations and industries will always have to have some in-person component, and we're definitely seeing a move toward hybrid events, but that means that there will still be an online component. And I think the real challenge of that is to create an experience that's equally good for both sides of that equation, which it hasn't been in the past. It's been awesome if you're physically in the room at that big event and you know the lights and the music and everything's tuned to you and then the online stream is you know jumpy and the uh, nobody's really monitoring the chat and it's just subpar for the people who are watching online and what we really need to do is create equally great experiences for both of those audiences because they both deserve to have a great experience so yes hybrids are future and online alone is not going away i know many other companies that are planning to still deliver the bulk of their training online because it's more convenient for people it lets them reach more people it's more inclusive and accessible right. to people in regions who maybe yes. can't uh, normally attend your events or your training so it's here to stay plus i think it's it's very democratizing this whole yeah. idea that the conclusion of the of the book i almost called it be your own broadcaster because that's what the promise of this platform is that yeah. you you can have an incredible content platform uh purely because you have access to this technology now yeah it is so true and you know i'm i'm certainly guilty of it right but um but it is so true and it's something that um that we it, we do find very democratizing and very very easy to do and also you know democratizing from the fact that if you can't even afford to go to a conference you really want to go to because you have to fly, rent a car, maybe a hotel, the meals. Now you can pay a lesser fee, still hit, you know, you don't get that hallway time. We could always talk about that. It's an option, yeah. but, but you know, you still get the chance to see the presentation. So you mentioned somebody while well, I'm watching the chat window. So first of all, let me give you a thank you from Magdalena, which was uh, very, very nice of you to come back and respond to us. So Dave Sollers has uh, a question. What are your most successful strategies for uh, checking in on the impact you are having with your audience. So while you are presenting, how do you find out if the audience is still with you? Great question, Dave. It's hard, right? It's one of the biggest challenges for people, people that are accustomed to presenting in person is they don't get the same feedback that they used to get when they were watching an audience in the room. You can tell whether they're engaged or not because their heads were up and they were, our eyeballs were aimed at you. And so it's hard for us to do that in these larger uh, virtual events where we don't actually see the video of everyone in the room. I pay attention to the chat and I'm noticing how many people are commenting and asking questions. It's a great sign to me that you're engaged, that you're uh, liking what's going on and, and you want to hear more. So that's one of the first ways. Certainly reaction buttons, if you have those accessible to you in the platform that you're using, that's a fun way to be able to take a pulse of the audience or other ways to take a pulse like polls. Now, the challenge with those sorts of interactions is, I think, that they can be a little overwhelming. You have to pace them. So in the book, I talk about three kinds of interactions, simple, moderate, and complex. And if you are trying to get your audience engaged in the conversation and they're not playing along, it could be because you're asking them to do too much too soon. So you're asking people to come off mute and make a comment or to... Uh, in our training workshops, we send people in their breakout rooms and sometimes they're just quiet. Well, it could be because they're not ready yet. They haven't really internalized the information or they're not feeling uh, capable of contributing at that level yet. So those lower involvement types of interactions, like the reactions, like polls or chat, is a safer way for a lot of people to contribute. And it doesn't, you don't have to be in a big extrovert uh, yeah. to make your voice heard. Yeah. Yeah. And great question, Dave, because I do think, you know, those of us who are presenters that like to present, that enjoy being in front of an audience when you're sitting at home alone in a room, uh, you want some feedback. So it's a great question. The other feedback question, of course, is, and, and this doesn't always apply to you when you're speaking at a, necessarily an online conference or a hybrid event, but Robin Baker, you nailed something that just in general, in meetings especially, but and to me, by the way, every meeting is a presentation. Every meeting is an opportunity to professionally present yourself on camera. Robin asked this great question. I'll, I work with a particular client that I am the only person on the call with my camera on. Nobody else turns their camera on. I'm not sure why we're just not on a, on a conference line, you know. But what's your reaction to, to Robin's question? How do you deal with an audience with a culture of no cameras during video calls? 
it's rough as a presenter. Again, I get it. But if you're the only one who's visibly participating and everybody is off camera, it can feel like you're playing to an empty room. And I know that that can be draining. I, I have to take the side of empathy and say there must be a reason why people are keeping their cameras off. And it's true that there are company cultures where that's more okay than not, where it's the norm for people to silently show up to meetings, stay on mute, stay off camera, and maybe they're multitasking. And uh, that could be true and that the culture allows that. But I also think that in this toward uh, 18 months into the pandemic, you know, there's been a lot of talk even early on about Zoom fatigue and the performative effort required to be on camera. And so when I say take the view of empathy, I think there are good reasons sometimes why people want to stay off camera. It could be because they've just expended so much energy earlier in the day and they really just want to be a, a watcher, a listener right now for your presentation. It could be because they're in a distracting environment. They don't want to distract you with the right. clutter or the noise or the activity happening. And so in our culture at Duarte, now we're a small business and we're very communication oriented, uh, but we also do. Uh, ask people to turn on their cameras if we're in a smaller setting, for instance, we really want everybody to actively participate. But we'll also in larger uh, conversations, larger meetings, say it's okay to keep your camera off. I think you have to give people that option. And yeah. that's really a leadership decision. It's a question sure. of what you want to instill in the culture. But I try not to take it personally as a presenter, because I know there could be good reasons for it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I absolutely get that, that part of it as well. I mean, you know, it, it could be a courtesy to the speaker and that's great. I mean, you know, we've all been on meetings where someone's literally driving while they're, they're in the meeting. So that's a I've little bit. I've been in meetings with people who are presenting while they were driving. Yeah, well, guess skill. what? Uh, my, my, my last, uh, one of my, one of my last presentations, I literally did in a parking lot on the side of the highway with my laptop on my steering wheel, uh, and my, my car as the background, but that was, as the presenter. So yeah, you're right. That's it, next it, level. It's, it's very much, next level, yes. that. but, but you know, I kind of think that's cool. And, you know, talking about a guy who had a CB radio, that's next level right there from a CB radio. So, well, it we got a couple sense. of comments, but I want to move on to the next um, slide here because it is about um, the presenter again, presenting this. I love this graphic, Patty. I love it. The three layers of presenting, right? Can you take us through it? Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, a way that you can think about this is it's almost three-dimensional communications, communicating in 3D. And these three layers are the three things that you can control in the camera view. So when people are watching you present virtually, uh, what they see is whatever the camera sees, but you can be deliberate and intentional. You hear me use those words a lot because I'm I'm a strategist, so I like to make choices strategically. You can be very deliberate and intentional about what they see, and that includes your environment. Whatever your backdrop is, whether it's a real one or a fake one, whether you're at home or at the office, that's a strategic choice. I decided to stay home and broadcast from my home office today with you, Al, because I wanted it to be more of a casual conversation. I knew that that, that was your uh, energy and vibe, and I thought it would be fun yeah, to do it that way. Absolutely. But sometimes I'll go into the office. I'll go into our one of our more professional-looking studios because that's what the moment demands. Yeah. So that's my background. Then there are my graphics. So you have graphics that you've been putting up. Sometimes they do a full-screen takeover. Sometimes they're overlaid, like the questions that people are asking. Yep. So those yep. are also things that we should be intentional about. And then there's you. There's you as the speaker, and yep. that is also something that you can control, what your audience sees of you, how much of you they see. So you want to make sure that the camera can see the parts of you that you want them to see, your full face, your hand gestures, uh, but also your wardrobe choices. What did you decide to wear that day? Is it a clean shirt? Is it a torn t-shirt? Somebody actually showed up to a meeting with me in a torn t-shirt, and I was, I was kind of bummed. Because I thought that meant he didn't respect me very Darn, much. Darn, I was going to wear my torn uh, T-shirt. But, uh, you know, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I went with the Vermont, the Vermont sweater vest today. The jacket's up on the on the door there because, you know, I don't know what I did. Yeah, so now you make me feel self-conscious. <laughs> no, but, you know, I want no, I want to just point out, though, you have brand. chosen a background here that I just love. Because, obviously, this is very personal to you. Uh, and it's very colorful. I, I you know, I notice you know you you kind of pick up the hues in your jacket from what's on the wall, which I think is really really cool. Uh, you know, and I think that's that's fantastic. And then behind me, I am literally in my office, and when you have a full shot, you've got all my toys uh, behind me. So you know, I love uh, it. Yeah, because and it's, people often think this is a virtual. 
I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, it's all right. Was it was because of that we get to know you a little bit better. I, I know that you're a Disney fan, yep. I'm guessing. Yeah, that's go. exactly right. Yeah, Disney fan, sports fan, uh, and uh, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd, uh, who are who are over this shoulder here, gives you another hint to what I add to my presentations. But if you know who those guys are, so absolutely anyway, enough yeah. about me. Uh, you know, I, I do want to say though that I think that that slide to me is just so key and important because to me it's the thing that so many people forget. It's about you. It's about you picking some great graphics, which we're going to talk about next. And it's about having a background that's not distracting. And I got to tell you something. I am going to, to rally against virtual backgrounds. I hate them. I think they're distracting. I think missing part of your head and your looks like your brain should be exposed because it, get cut, it gets cut off by the technology. I know you're not on the beach in Bermuda. Let's get over it, you know. And let's, you know, really work on the background, if you will, of where you are. So good. Well, well I'm going to jump. I'm sorry. I would just say that you're expressing the opinion of a lot of people in the survey that we just did as well. That was the number one pet peeve. It was a very fake looking background. Yeah. And they're okay if you can light them properly and you got a good green screen and you got dark enough hair you can get by. But yeah, a lot of times they look cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. All right. So, Christine, thanks for waiting because your question came in a little while ago. Christine writes, do you think that virtual presenting is an opportunity for those who are shy presenting? So this is a fantastic question. Patty, take it away. I love that question because I am that question, Christine. <laughs> I've been presenting and speaking for a long time, but that doesn't mean that I'm not still shy. So I'm right on the cusp between extrovert and introvert. And for me personally, moving to virtual has been a blessing. I've enjoyed it so much more than standing on a big stage. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't like to do it. So please call me if you have a big opportunity. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily turn it down, especially if it was in Bermuda. Then I would definitely go. But it's, I think it's true. Then, then you can really be on the beach, Patty. Okay. There yeah. we go. Then I will definitely be there. <laughs> but I, I think for introverts, it is a more comfortable way to present. If you're naturally or certainly nervous about being on a big stage, then this limits what your audience can see. You can be a little bit more uh, careful in what you show and and uh, you can sit if that is more comfortable for you, although it's often better if you stand so your energy is higher. But I think it is a forgiving medium in a lot of ways. So long as you still put the energy into planning what you're going to say, developing graphics that will support what you're going to say, rehearsing and bringing the energy so that your audience uh, stays engaged with you the whole way. Uh, but it can feel a little lower stakes in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Outstanding. Good. Well, you know, Robin Baker, who asked the question about no cameras, um, he made a comment. He said, you know, it's very demoralizing on our end when we talk to the wall for the whole training session. And so it's funny how these two questions kind of go hand in hand. But, you know, to both of you, Christine and Robin, too, I'm going to throw a suggestion out. There are other there are other platforms out there besides Zoom and, 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 and Teams and things like that. We are on StreamYard today. And one way, Robin, uh, in one way, Christine, to have both support for you if you're a shy presenter or if you don't want to talk to the wall is get a co-host. Um, have someone that you can present with uh, who can be your co-host. And I think that makes for a very, very um, dynamic and interesting presentation. So Robin, I love that you... suggestion. I think that's 100% dead on. We talked about earlier how to keep your presentation interesting so your audience is lured back in. And variety in content is one way, but also variety in the delivery. So having mm -hmm. the two of us with different voices and different uh, styles of presenting and communicating just creates natural contrast, which is something that our brains also like. Contrast draws our attention and makes things interesting. So I love that suggestion. And I would also say, Robin, I, I feel your pain. I really do. And I don't want to be dismissive of it. But it, you, one of the ways that you can also give yourself some of that positive feedback is uh, find a co-conspirator in the audience. So you can have a co-presenter, but you can also have a co-conspirator in the audience. Maybe somebody that you talk with ahead of time and ask them to turn on their camera and make sure that they've got a question or two that they're going to pose to you so that uh, there's a little extra energy in the room. In show business, we call that a plant. So there, there you go. There you go. Good deal. All right. So we're going to move on here to what I think is the core of, of the Duarte group and what you guys are about and really how it all started and how it all needs to continue. And that comes down to 
Um, I, I, I want, I want one of those red circles with the line through it, right? Slides with too much crap on it. I'm going to call it that. So tell us a bit about this graph. Yeah, it'll be a little hard for you all to see in this tiny version, but essentially what it's describing is a three-step process for simplifying your slides, which is really important for virtual presentations because a lot of times people are looking at your presentation on a smaller device, certainly a smaller than a nice big LED screen uh, or plasma screen in a meeting room and definitely a lot bigger than a big jumbotron in a, a major event venue. So because people are likely looking at your slides on a smaller device, you need to strip down the content even more than if you were presenting in person. Pare away that extra information so that what's left can be bigger and easier to read for your audience. So that three-step process we call a spa treatment for your slides. So they go and get like a little blowout. Uh, <laughs> you essentially uh, simplify by removing the information that's not the most important thing on your slide. Uh, then you plan how you're going to uh, lay out out what's left on the slide and then you accentuate the most important thing on the slide that's left Ooh, look at my hair now talk about accentuate <laughs> i won't do that again uh, but essentially it's all about stripping away the non-essential information so that you can emphasize the main point more clearly and what that will do is make it easier for your audience to be able to read at a glance what your main point is and not have your slides be competing with you because our brains can't do those two things at the same time listen to all your words and read all your words uh, we're going to have to make a choice about what we pay attention to and then it can create overload for your audience yeah, I think even if you're watching this on your iPhone right now, you know, the upper left hand side, you see a lot of words and you see a little graph. The lower right hand side, you probably can make out the words record growth. And that's the bottom line. That's what you want people to see and to understand. And that's, you know, by Slideology, by Resonate, by Illuminate, and then by this present book that we're talking about here. Uh, presenting virtually. And I got to tell you, you will nail it every time. So. Being mindful of your time, uh, I want to get into the last thing. I will put it on my giant pet peeve list of the days of not only presenting, but also being in a meeting, but we're talking about presenting today. And that is format, right? That is technology, lighting. You have to think like a TV studio, if you will. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I want to point out one thing, first of all, to everybody in the audience, everybody watching this. We are both hardwired as host and as guest. Nance, uh, or, uh, uh, Patty and I are both hardwired to the wall and to our computers. So there's been some confusion about that, even with my guests in the past. When I say hardwired, I mean find that box, that's your router. There are multiple plugs in the back of it. There's a plug on the side of your laptop or on your desktop. Plug the wire in from that to your machine and get off the Wi-Fi. That's what hardwire means. So I'll just, I laid that one out for everybody, Patty, because it is such a passionate, uh, I had I, I, I had three executives on from a very, very well-known company a couple of months ago. I said to all of them, please hardwire, and none of them did. And it was the most difficult conversation I have ever, ever had. You got to hardwire, folks. But then you got to do, you got to buy the book and you got to do what Patty tells you to. So Patty, let's take you what's wrong. What, 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 let's take everybody uh, through what's wrong in the graphics you have here that are on the screen right now. Well, yeah. So at the top, what you see is probably a scene you've seen before. If you've been in some uh, Zoom or WebEx or other meeting online and somebody was sitting in front of a window, then they get uh, essentially overexposed or their face is underexposed. And so then you can't see their facial features. So that's what's wrong with that picture at the top. What he should have done was closed his window shades or blinds or just pivot pivot his seat so that he's got a light source coming to the front or to the side, but not from behind. And then down below, well, that's kind of an awkward camera angle. It's not the worst one I've ever seen. Mm -mm. <laughs> he's, But his camera is a little too low. So it's looking at his face from below. I've seen others where people are uh, pointing up their nose or maybe uh, they're just sitting up too high and the camera is in a really awkward place. Uh, so don't do that. 
the goal is essentially to have the camera at eye level so that you can maintain eye contact with your audience because the camera is the eyes of the audience. So that's where I've been trying to look this whole time to make sure that you see my eyes and uh, feel like we're more connected to each other. And that breaks when you have your camera pointed in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a pro tip too, by the way, right? Because I think when people feel like you are looking at them, they are buying into more so what you're saying. They're listening where if you have a presenter who is reading off their notes uh, and the audience is in front of them and they're doing this, which by the way, I see 75% of the time, uh, you know, it's a much diff- a much more difficult game for both presenter and viewer. Uh, so looking dead on into the camera it's a yeah. skill you have to develop. But yeah, I, I so wholeheartedly agree with it. But then you have another graphic in the book and you show people, this is what it can look like. And, you know, and this, this gentleman may have a ring light, you know, this, he may have something else going on, but mostly, and you took the, you, you, you over, oversaw the picture. What, what went into the, to taking this shot? I mean, is there anything special about the way he lit himself for this photograph or for this, this, he does. this shot? Yeah, he does have a ring light. He had a fill light, so a little lamp on his desk. Yep. He had a ring light on the secondary monitor that his webcam is on top of. So the webcam is what he's looking into. It's not mm-hmm. a laptop camera. And uh, and I think he also had some overhead lighting as well. And so the lighting is better, right? It's evenly lit. So you can see all parts of his face. And that means you can read his expressions, which is great. He's also situated himself so that the camera, uh, his eyes are in the top third of what the frame that the camera sees, which is uh, something that you can steal from television and film, the rule yeah. of thirds and where the camera looks, again, to maintain that eye contact, but also so that his face and his gestures can be seen within the frame. And all of that just maximizes the uh, amount of uh, communication you can get across to his audience. And so I noticed that, that you have been fully gesturing throughout our conversation. Talk a bit about that, please. Well, it's it, it, we have to find all the ways that we can to maximize our presence. I talk about it in the book as virtual presence, uh, which is trying to uh, approximate as much as possible what it's like to be physically face to face. And the problem is technology gets in the way of that. And it turns us into almost like a flatter version of ourselves, which means that for people to actually feel our presence, we have to magnify what they can see and hear. So we need to uh, use vocal variety, but also use our gestures intentionally. Not all the time. Sometimes my hands are down on my desktop and I'm not actually gesturing. But when I want to make a point, a specific point or three points, then I want to use my hands to reinforce what I'm saying visually and make sure that that scene within the camera frame. Yeah. Yeah. And you do it brilliantly, by the way, which you're the teacher. So, you know, you do. Um, I threw up the the comments and questions uh, banner across the bottom one more time because we're going to wrap up soon. So um, I I kind of chose some of the content today. If you couldn't read some of that content, it's too small. I have a solution for you Buy the book. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get around back to that in a second. So, Patty, what have we not covered today that you want people to know about about this subject and about the book, I guess, you know, kind of summary case, where do you want us to go with this? Well, one of the things that we didn't cover is that there were a few different types of virtual presentations. And one of the questions earlier, uh, Magdalena, I think uh, in the virtual presentation, uh, attention span is shorter. And so in the book, I talk about the three types of presentations, uh, essentially a linear, interactive, and collaborative. And depending on what your communication goals are for the presentation, you can choose one of those three formats, and they need to be uh, the right length for that format as well. So essentially, a simple way to think of it is the more interaction you have with your audience, the longer the presentation can be. So a collaborative presentation is like a workshop or a working session. That could be 45 to 60 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes is often our training sessions are broken into 90 minute chunks. But for an interactive presentation that has a little bit of interaction like this one does, you can ask us some questions, we'll take some of your feedback and we have interaction with each other. That needs to be a little shorter, but it can still be longer than a linear presentation, which is basically like a pre-recorded video or a monologue that you give maybe as a traditional keynote or perhaps an explainer video that you pre-record. Those really need to be short, 30 minutes or less. Sometimes it's even better for them to be between 15 and 20 minutes. And all of that 
is to say that your audience does have a limited attention span and they're going to be less able to stay focused on you if you're going to drone on and on and on and on without engaging them. So the more interactive your presentation, the longer it can be, the less interactive, the shorter it should be. Fundamentally, just be kind to your audience. Mm, yeah. No, fantastic. Some of the things too, we haven't even touched on and, and then the book covers and, you know, there, there is the setting of lighting of, of microphones of what yeah. camera to use. All of these things are important. All these things are covered and, and they're, you know, for, for just a few dollars and, you know, I'm, I'm talking by a few hundred, maybe two, you really want to go crazy. If you want to get a camera uh, wildly crazy, you can, you can do that as well, but to up your game just a little bit in the, in the presenting game and even the meeting game, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but you can get, and you know, I'll, I'll hold it up here. This blue Yeti mic, which is what I have used over, over the time. Uh, you're going to hold yours up too. There you go. Same color and everything. Um, you know, it is such a minimal investment for people who are on a line a bit. So I, I think it's fantastic. So, you know, uh, we're, we're going to wrap things up. So let's really get down to what we're here to talk about today. And that is let's buy the book. Tell us about the places we can find it and tell us about, you know, what uh, what we should be looking for when we buy that book. Absolutely. So you can find presenting virtually where books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. There's a little bit of a supply chain challenge right now. So getting a print copy from one of those retailers might take a little longer than I would want. Uh, but it's the world we're living in right now. But you can also buy an ebook. There's also an audiobook coming soon. I wrapped up a couple of weeks ago and it should be available for purchase very soon. And uh, I would love to hear your reactions to the book after you read it. You can find me on LinkedIn. I connect with practically anybody who reads is out to me there. So connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message, tell me what resonated with you, uh, what you're going to try, maybe what other questions you have. And uh, we're going to be holding a webinar too at Duarte in just a couple of weeks. You can join us and learn more tips there too. Well, that's outstanding. I, I can't wait to see that myself. A couple more comments came in. Let me throw them up here uh, really quickly. Uh, first of all, we have from Patrick Tinney, a great point. I'm finding two hours of training is the max. I generally open with one, a one hour session. So Patrick, uh, I, I know for a fact is a sales trainer. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's really, really helpful. And I think sales trainers, some of the sales trainers in my life have done very, very well adapting to uh, this this opportunity to present online. Uh, here is Soma who says, the book is a wonderful resource. Thanks so much. I bought. Ah, that is fantastic. Yay. Thank you. Good deal, Soma. And then Haley is back. There you go. Love the book. Thank you, Haley. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Patty, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on here today. Same. I'm going to give you the screen and just go ahead and wrap it up, please. Well, like Al and I were talking about, this reality is not going anywhere anytime soon. Virtual communication is part of our everyday work, and I think it's going to continue for a very long time. So it pays to get good at virtual communication. It certainly will uh, increase your career prospects if you have this ability, because now there are a lot of roles that depend on virtual communication, sales, business development, leadership. Leaders are leading virtually. And so... If you invest in building these skills, you will have greater influence, greater impact, and uh, you'll also make it easier for your audience to stay engaged. Uh, so I think it's worth your time, and I can't wait to see how your influence grows as you become just like Al is, a virtual broadcaster who's gonna change the world. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Oops. I'm sorry. We had an audio issue. I was just told. I was saying thank you. And I said we sold the book. So there you go. I apologize for that there. Yeah, you know, that's all right. I, I thought it was just me and my earbuds. No, 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 no. It, uh, we we, uh, we, had a, we had a little glitch there in the audio. But thank you, Magdalene. We appreciate that. Uh, and Anne, thank you for that. I think up. I picked up. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to put you backstage and we'll say goodbye uh, off, off camera here in a bit. And I'll wrap things up. Thanks. Well, uh, I got to tell you, folks, uh, 50 minutes of pure, uh, pure, fantastic. You have a sandwich, right? You've got the bread, 
uh, on both ends and you got the meat. We delivered the meat today. Patty is a fantastic guest. Um, I'm never disappointed with any of the people from Duarte. So very, very cool that, that she is here. We've got some more guests coming up. I asked you to watch the social media platform you're watching this on today. Or certainly hit me up on LinkedIn at Al Gettler. And uh, by all means, like Patty said for her, she's at Patty Sanchez, just her name. Uh, go ahead and reach out to us on LinkedIn and join on uh, the talk. And then you'll also be notified when I do one of these shows again in the future. So with that, thank you all very much for being here today. I wish you a good day and we'll see you again real soon.